Right, I'm cooler than you are. Why don't you fix your little problems and light this candle? Hey, hi, how you doing? Welcome to Dino Aerospace. Today we're going to be looking at Compi 1, 2, and 3. Uh, the build, design, and launches. So here in Blender is my model for Compi. It's just completely designed by myself here um, with some inspiration from Dylan, my son. This is actually Compi 2 and 3. Slight modifications were made to Compi 1 to help with stability, uh, which may or may not have been successful. Uh, so the design's pretty simple, just two pieces, the body and the nose cone. Um, just kind of a custom design rocket to be fun. Uh, this wasn't really meant to go very high or be very aerodynamic, it was just meant to look more like a cartoon or toy rocket that actually flew. Um, so this is the color scheme for Compi 1, which was white and red, Compi 2 was white and orange, and Compi 3 that my niece fired off was white and pink. Uh, so looking at the body here, we'll pull the nose cone apart. Looking at the body, just a simple shape. I have the engine compartment uh, built into the model with a little lip up inside there uh, to hold uh, the engine in place while under thrust. Uh, besides that, a B or C type motor with an adapter slid right in and a D type motor uh, would have fit with no adapter. Um, some of the changes I made from Compi 1 to 2 and 3 are I thinned down this lower section here around the engine uh, to help bring the center of mass higher and I increased the surface area of the fins to help bring the center of pressure a little bit lower. Uh, with such a sh kind of short, bulky design, uh, I, was having, uh, I put this uh, into open rocket and I had some stability concerns. The center of mass was kind of in the center of the rocket and the center of pressure was just a hair lower. Uh, so we did not have, like it was a ratio of about a 0.3 I think is what open rocket had for stability, which isn't good. You want between one and two. So the adjustments to comp E2 and three help bring the center of mass a little bit higher and the center of pressure a little bit lower, uh, which I think helped. However, I had a, a more powerful engine in for comp E2 and three which will just exacerbate any stability concerns you have. Compi-1 actually launched fine. It was very stable. Um, but that was with the B, B6 engine. Compi's 2 and 3 I launched with the C6 engine. So twice the impulse and a longer burn time. So you, know, you get higher speeds and more thrust and the stability. You'll see in the videos, which you probably already saw in the intro to this video. But they were all mostly successful. We did end up losing Compi 3. Uh, I just went off into the trees over a fence and I couldn't even see it through the, the brush. You couldn't get to it, couldn't find it. So that was unfortunate. But we have Compi 1 and 2 still back. Um, they did all break fins. These fins were really thin and 3D printed, so not very strong. Plenty strong for flight, just not strong for landing. Compi uh, 2 landed under parachute. It was a 9 inch parachute. May not have been large enough for the weight of this rocket. It's about a 195 gram rocket with the engine, like dry or wet mass. So it came down. Uh, undershoot control just hit the ground. These fins first here, which as soon as it hits on one of these fins, it puts a lot of stress and strain on on the thinner part of the fin, and it just snapped off. That's okay. I can blow it pretty easy. That's what I did with Compi One and reflew it once. Alright, uh, so looking at the design, we already showed you the engine compartment, the fins, and the body, and then the nose cone. Um, so the body is mostly hollow. You'll see here, I probably could have thinned out the walls a little bit to help with weight, but that's okay. And then the nose cone, um, I did the same kind of styles with my RG class rockets where I have a hollow nose cone and I have the shock mount. Uh, kind of pre-built into the nose cone. 
which works well. I love that design. And the nose comes, comes off very quickly. And then the shock mount is attached to it. And it doesn't you know, protrude from the bottom of the extension of the nose cone, so I don't, I'm not going to take up space. Because this rocket, packing, wadding, and a shoot in here, was a pretty tight fit. There wasn't much room in this rocket. So I guess you can't get a good idea for scale. Um, for example, the height of this piece is about 176 millimeters and then the height of the nose cone is 145. So we're looking at about 320 millimeters, which is about a foot, a little over 12 inches. So not a very large rocket, which is why it's named after Coffee or Copsignatus, a small, pesty little dinosaur. At least that's what trade you know, most. I think that's about it for the design. Uh, printing went very well. It was simple. Um, the first couple times I'd actually, hang on, printing the, the body here, the small little surface area of the bottom of these little fin ends, uh, I did get some problems printing. It would print up here and then this little piece would get detached when it would try to start printing the, the fin coming over here and it would uh, force itself out and then the print failed like once or twice. So what I did, I just came in and I expanded the surface area. I had this more tapered off down here. So a small area here is more you know, aerodynamic looking. So what I did was I kind of flattened this out and then I squashed it up. It did extend farther down. I squashed it up so it didn't have to print as tall of a little spire here before it printed the fin. Uh, but once I fixed that, then it printed just fine. Uh, quite a bit of plastic because it's all, all 3D printed, the entire rocket tube, no body tube. So then the nose cone went fine. Maybe a little sharp for, <laughs> for this rocket, but but it, it went well, it flew well. It was a fun rocket to, to design and build and launch. The kids loved it. And that's it. Uh, now we'll move on to some of the assembly and launch explanation videos. So here is Compu 2. Uh, made some slight modifications to the first one. So here's Compu 1. Compu 2. Not much, but a little bit. So I was a little worried about stability. So this fin right here, the surface area is not too great. Uh, and the center of mass was a little low because it's all a 3D printed body. You know, I don't have a nice long like tube to to help bring that center of mass up. So for Compu 2, I reduced some mass down here at the bottom, uh, which will help bring the center of mass a little bit higher. And then I increased the surface area of these fins here that will help bring the center of pressure a little lower because the center of mass and the center of pressure were a little too close and I was concerned with stability. Uh, it flew fine, so I'm not too worried about it, but I figured I'd make some adjustments to to help help it fly, especially since I'm having a more powerful engine and it's gonna burn for longer uh, to help it stay stable while it's going fast. Uh, so here's Comfy 2, it's painted bright orange to help see it. Um, everything else is identical, I incorporate a little hook into the, the nose cone here. It's mostly hollow all the way up. I do stop it here to help add some mass to the top, but it's mostly hollow with uh, this little hook integrated into it to attach the parachute. Actually, I don't want to take it apart because I already got Compu1 all packed up. Compu1 was a solid nose cone, and I just screwed an eye bolt in there, or an eye screw in there to attach the parachute, but here I've incorporated it into the 3D model. I'm thinking about posting uh, some of these models that I've made to Thingiverse. Uh, so if there's any interest in that, let me know in the comments down below. Yeah, potentially do that. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing first is tying the shock cord around this little mount I made and epoxying it down in here towards the bottom. So there's a little bit of support plastic on here. So what I use, I, I use a few different kinds of JB Weld or, you know, five minute epoxy, that Gorilla Glue epoxy works fine. For any of these rockets, these small rockets, there aren't barely any forces applied, so it doesn't really matter. I could probably just throw a few dots of super glue on there too, it'd be just fine. Uh, by using this quick setting, JB Weld, uh, actually this is the steel reinforced kind, I meant to grab the plastic. Uh, I might swap that out, be right back. So here's what we're going to be using. A plastic bonder, JB Weld, made for plastic to plastic, which is exactly what we got here. Uh, it works on other materials too, but this will work. 
So first thing I do is I tie an amount of shot cord to that. It makes it to where you can't really get it out right because it's tied tight in there all the way in the middle of the rocket body. There's no real way to remove it, uh, but you don't really need to. You can just cut it if you, you know, you're gonna get rid of it. So I like to do, it's called a Duncan knot. I think it has some other names too, like a uni knot or uni slip knot or something like that. But uh, just loop it through, pull it back quite a bit, bring it back on itself again, and then you're gonna wrap it around itself, similar to a fishing knot. Wrap it around here multiple times. I usually do about three or four. Then you just pull on both of these ends at the same time. Oh, that looped around. Tighten it up, and then now you just pull the part that isn't short, and it cinches the knot up, just like a fishing knot. Nice and tight, and it's not gonna slip through, like if you just did a single knot or a double knot like you're used to, uh, it can very easily loosen itself up and pull itself out. But this will be plenty strong. Then I like to wrap a little bit of masking tape right up against the knot. Uh, it helps helps hold the knot, you know, prevent any slippage in case it does start to come out, as well as getting rid of any extra shot cord or line in there that can just potentially cause snagging issues. And then you can cut it off real close here and you don't have to worry about it slipping through. And now, nice, clean, tight knot. Now we'll be epoxying this into the body. I like to just use cardboard, any scrap cardboard or thick pieces of paper I have around to mix the epoxy on so I can just throw it away and don't have to deal with it. That's pretty much gone, so it's kind of burped the rest of it out. Uh, make sure you mix it up real well. This stuff sets pretty fast, but you have plenty of time to do something small with this. I did not mean to get this much epoxy. I think while this, before that gets too hard, I'm gonna go ahead and prep the other one too. Since this rocket is so shallow, I'm gonna just snip this little extra mount I have here. Um, that's just for more surface area for a tighter bond with a rocket, but these this rocket's so small and the forces are small that I can just use this little bit here. Always fun when you're rushing against the clock on epoxy that you're not ready to use. Um, I got some of this thick shock cord at the hobby shop, um, but that's way too heavy duty for all the rocket work I've been doing. It's stuff bunches, it's hard to get it to fit in the, the rocket bodies of these smaller rockets. So I would recommend just this paracord or even string. It's not like these are blown apart with so much force that you need that actual elastic property to prevent it from tearing itself out. Or I'm totally wrong on that, we'll find out. I haven't had any issues yet. Now that oxys wasn't quite mixed, but we can go ahead and mix it all the way since we're about ready to use it. Okay. Go ahead and do Compi 2 first. Compi 2 and 3 are identical except for the paint job. Compi 3 I made for my niece to shoot. They're gonna go out with us to the field tomorrow. We just go to a local elementary school. There's no good place around where I live that's any more open than a school field, which is unfortunate. I'm gonna lose a lot of rockets because of that. So for this one, I can just use my finger in there to, once I get it in place. So 
I need to hold it down for a little bit before that starts to set and then you're good. Moved it around too much in there and kind of spread it out. It's actually easier to do on the bigger rockets. There we go. And then once that epoxy dries, that's never going to come out of there, no matter how hard that new spoon blows off. Set that one aside to dry. So here's copy three, a little fancy hard work. Didn't turn out as great as I hoped, but I'm no artist. Um, but the same exact design as copy two that I already showed you. How you doing? Here we are preparing copy one for it's uh, another day of flight. You see here, I did some super gluing uh, to repair a fin. Had a good flight, late chute opening, and a little bit of burning on the chute with not enough wadding in there. So, uh, fix those problems here today. Uh, the rocket flew fine. I was a little worried about stability uh, because of its kind of funny shape. Um, open rocket had it have some stability problems. Uh, I launched it with a B6 engine and it flew great. Flew straight, just a late shoot opening was the biggest deal. So, going with the C63 this time, so get some more height and a less delay shoot, uh, less time delay on the shoot. Uh, looks like it should be a good timing on that, so it'll work out. I also 3D print these little, I don't know exactly what you call them, they uh, go over your, your launch guide pole. Um, they're just Pretty straightforward. I made them to where they can zip tie to a rocket, so it's pretty easy to fit them on any rocket I want. I was thinking of modeling that into the rocket body, especially for the Compi class, because it's entirely 3D printed. But mostly I just use cardboard tubes, so I like these little zip tied on devices. Uh, so here we are. Shot cord's already attached. Uh, I'll show you on Compi's 2 and 3 how I do that. And then the chute is already attached as well. Now the chute's a little torn up already, but I'm just going to go ahead and use it since Compi 1 has already flown and is damaged. Just going to see what happens with this and put new chutes in for Compi 2 and 3 and RG3 going out to the range tomorrow to launch all four of these. So, I mean, everything's already connected correctly here. Uh, we got good lines on everything. I'm going to go ahead and fold the chute up. So, fold it up to where all the lines come out of about the same area. I want this chute to open fast, so I'm going to just tuck the lines inside the chute here. Fold it up. Roll this up here. Now one thing I forgot to do is get the wadding out. So there's no wadding in the rocket yet, so I'm just gonna set something heavy on this chute that's nicely unfolded. Here's what I usually take out to the range. It's got a lot of all my engines, plugs, igniters, uh, some nichrome wire. Uh, if I run out of igniters, I can kind of make my own there. Um, a few of the 3D printed parts I use for shot cord mounts and the guide rail mounts, uh, some tools, of course. I got quite a bit of the wadding and some extra 9 volt batteries for the controller. So. so lesson learned on this rocket. I only used two pieces of wadding the first time and I had that melted together chute. Chute came out clean, came out just fine. Nose cone popped off, pulled the chute out. It extended, it's just when it hit the ground. It opened a little late as well, but it, it when it hit the ground, it uh, was already kind of scorched and melted together. So it wasn't going to open even if it had more time. 
So I'm gonna use three pieces of wadding. This is kind of a fairly, fairly large diameter in here. So I think three would have been the right call right off the bat. I'm gonna shove all three of those down in there. There's not too much room in this um, because it's 3D printed so it's pretty thick compared to a cardboard tube and it's not very deep. Nose cone perhaps I probably could have made a little bit shorter. Uh, raised up this joint to where there's less of a nose cone and more body. I think that would have been the better call. So now let's pack the chute. Lay the excess shot cord in there. Just kind of ball it up and put it in there on top. And it'll all come out nice and clean when that charge goes off, pops the nose cone off. Yeah, just together nice and snug, uh, but not too tight that it can't just pop right off. Because actually, if you rotate it, because the 3D printing, I guess the X and Y axes weren't you know, exactly uniform on the printing. It's, a, it's slightly elongated. The model is perfectly circular, but the printing is elongated. So in a certain position, it's nice and it's really loose. And if I put it in like that and rotate it, it almost just locks into place and gets really tight. Um, so right before I launch, I definitely want to make sure it's in maybe not the super soft spot so I don't lose it if it starts to tumble a little bit, but just turn it just a hair to where it holds it in place but it's easily pop out. Yeah, so now we just got done packing the chute. So Compi 1 repaired, ready to fly again. All I need to do is stick a uh, new engine in. So I made this diameter uh, to match like the D uh, size engines. Uh, and also, I'm using a B and a C, right? This can be the C63 that I told you about. Uh, it will fit in here with this little adapter. It fits in there nice and snug. It's a good fit. Like that. So, this rocket is ready to fly. Right, so here we are. Welcome to Microsoft Excel. This is a little flight calculation slash simulation program I wrote. Um, so, We'll run through it all right now. Uh, it's still a work in progress, so I actually just did something that broke it. So if I try and simulate it long, so it'll get stuck and eventually uh, I'll get a bug in the code, but that's fine. We'll work on that. Um, but for what I'm showing you right now, this works just fine. Uh, so, so far it's just has, there's no drag, no error, aerodynamic forces, nothing like that applied. It's just uh, the mass of the rocket and the force is applied by the engine and gravity. That's all that's that's being accounted for here. No aerodynamics, no no wind, nothing like that. So, um, what we're just going to look at right now doesn't include the thrust curve, even though I have I've had that working, where I include the thrust curve data in the calculation. But we'll get to that. So right now, what I have is uh, a handful of rocket engines that you can select which one you're using. Uh, what that does is it pulls the thrust duration information, the total impulse of that engine, and the time delay for the chute, as well as it takes the mass of that engine and adds it to whatever dry mass of the rocket you input uh, to get a total wet mass of the rocket. Uh, so the data for these is here. So the different rockets with the total impulse, time delay, uh, the max lift weight, the max thrust, the thrust duration, and the weight of that engine. That data I get from thrustcurve.org. Uh, for all the different Estes engines that I'm going to be using and I've been calculating for. So here's most of that data. And then the thrust curve data is right here. But uh, I haven't found a good way of getting the actual data in like a comma delineated format. But uh, if you go to the view certification docs and the PDF, then here is the Estes B6. And here's actual testing done that shows the thrust curve data that they had on that previous page. So this is the data I get. And I take that data into Excel and I put it here and then I can calculate from that the forces applied at the given moments to get a velocity profile and an altitude profile. Now like I said that that's not fully functioning right now but we're not going to use that. So we're going to be launching Compies 1, 2, and 3 on a C63 engine. Um, okay, so the mass of Compies uh, dry mass is around 150 grams, so we'll put in 150 grams. Uh, the C63 engine gives us a thrust duration of 1.86 seconds, total impulse of 8.8 .8 newton seconds, and a time delay of the chute charge of 3 seconds. 
So for just the simple calculation of no drag and not implementing thrust curve and working that out, um, the easiest way to do it is you take the total impulse and you divide that by the, the thrust duration to get the average force applied by that engine over that 1.86 seconds. So that will give you the same impulse if you applied a 4.73 Newton force for 1.86 seconds. That will give you an 8.8 .8 Newton second impulse. Now the actual engine doesn't perform at 4.73 uh, Newtons of force for that 1.86 seconds. You get a, a peak at the beginning. And we'll look at the real thrust curve here. A peak at the beginning that goes all the way up to about 12 Newtons and then it comes down tapers off and you have a nice steady thrust for most of the flight and then it tapers off at the end as it burns out. Uh, so now see average thrust they get 5.03 newtons I get 4.73 and that's just with a little bit of uh, numbers here and there. So, so we look at that and we see that if we imagine that that engine put out 4.73 newtons for the duration of 1.86 seconds and calculate what that does to the rocket uh, we can get a pretty good idea of all the parameters of the flight. So applying that, we now have a wet mass of 174 grams. That includes the dry mass of the Compi plus the mass of a C63 engine. Uh, with that force, we look at the acceleration that that force produces. So the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass, uh, the famous equation of F equals MA, um, one of Newton's laws of motion. Um, you apply a force to a mass, you get an acceleration. So we're finding out that acceleration from the average force for 1.86 seconds divided by the mass of 174 grams gives us an acceleration of 27.2 meters per second per second, which is meters per second squared. Now we can get the velocity after 1.86 seconds of that acceleration. That is done by the equation of velocity is equal to the acceleration times the time. So now we have our 27.2 meters per second squared of acceleration upwards due to the force of that, but we have to add in the acceleration due to gravity. Gravity is pulling down on the rocket the entire time that the thrust is pushing up. So we add those two, so we get the 27.2 and then add a negative 9.8, which gets us, you know, about 19 or 18. Uh, I guess that's more like 10, so it gets us about 17 meters per second squared times the, for the total duration, which it was accelerating for almost two seconds, that gets us a final velocity of the rocket at the end of the burn of 32.3 meters per second. So that's about our max velocity we'd expect to see. Um, and then we see the distance that it traveled while under that acceleration. So to find out how high it was at the end of the thrust profile. So this is all, this whole, all I'm talking about now is just while the rocket is under thrust. So the height of the rocket at the end of the thrust when the engine burns out uh, is this equation here which is just your kinematics equation for the distance an object will travel while under an acceleration it's one half times acceleration times the time squared uh, and here the acceleration we got to account for gravity because we're going to have the acceleration of the thrust plus gravity pulling down to give us our overall acceleration times time squared and then end up with a 5.56 meter height at the end of that burn which is about you know 18 20 feet uh, but that's just while it's under thrust, right? That's not... It's going to be traveling upwards at 32 meters per second, so it's going to continue on a ballistic trajectory, just coasting upwards after the thrust is done. So when the engine's burned out, it should be about 20 feet off the ground. So now we have the... While it is in free fall, so under a ballistic trajectory, but still ascending, still going upwards. The thrust is done, but it's still flying upwards now. So we know its initial velocity at this point is the velocity when it's done with the thrust, when the thrust is burned out, so 32.4 you know, meters per second. Now we can find out how long, starting out at that speed going upwards, it will take for the rocket to reach Apogee. All, right, all we have now is gravity pulling down on it. So now we find out the time it takes for that rocket to go from 32 meters per second to zero meters per second, while only under the influence of gravity. And that time is about 3.3 seconds. And so now we can calculate the distance that that rocket traveled while under the acceleration of gravity for 3.3 seconds. And we get 53.38 meters. So it only went about 6 meters under thrust and then it coasted for about 53 meters. So we're, and then, so that gives us an apogee 
uh, those two numbers added together. The height of the burnout and the height of uh, the, just the free fall after burnout. So we have an apogee of this rocket of about 58.9 meters, which is, uh, multiply that by 3.28, uh, so that will give us around you know 170 feet. Uh, maybe a little more, maybe less. I don't know. It's in my, off the top of my head. Let's just see here. Let's equals apogee times 3.28. 193 feet. So we should go about 200 feet with this rocket. And now we're looking at free fall descending, just how long this rocket would take to fall if it wasn't under a parachute, if it was just falling like a mass falling with no drag um, from a height of 58.9 meters. Uh, that total time of fall will be 3.46 seconds, and then it'll have a velocity when it impacts the ground of 33.9 meters per second. So now here's our big picture takeaways from this simple calculation. We have an apogee of 58.95 meters. Oh, and here's my feet calculation. I already did it. Of 193 feet. Uh, total time to apogee, the time of under thrust plus the free fall time. So it'll reach apogee about 5.16 seconds. And then the total flight time, including the falling of 3.46 seconds, gives us a total flight time of 8.63 seconds. So from launch to landing should be about 8.6 seconds. So we'll see how all this checks out when we actually look at the launches. And now that uh, that accounts for level ground, right? Like in most of my launches that we'll see for Compi, it goes up and actually lands either in a lower field or in the trees. So that kind of changes things. Um, and they could come fall under shoot, so that time will change too. Now we can look at when we want our parachute to deploy because we don't want our parachute to deploy immediately when it's going 32 meters per second upwards. It could rip the chute right off the rocket. We don't want it to coast up to apogee and start falling and then open sometime when it's also going you know, 20 or 30 meters per second on the way down and it wouldn't have much time to deploy and, and slow the rocket down. So we would like to deploy the chute right at apogee. If we deploy the chute at apogee, there will be uh, zero vertical velocity and there's plenty of time for that chute to open as the rocket begins to fall. So the optimum deploy time based on this calculation is after thrust to apogee, this 3.3 seconds right here. That's our optimum deploy time. And we see this C63 engine has a time to delay of three seconds. So we're at about 90% of the 3.3 seconds when the chute will deploy. So it should deploy a little bit on the way up according to this math here. Um, and then the velocity at shoot deploy will only be three meters per second, which is only about 9.6 feet per second, which looks like, based on my research online, around 20 feet per second is the kind of danger zone for these little plastic chutes where you might start ripping them. Uh, so we're well within that that metric. And then the altitude at shoot deploy, uh, it's pretty close to apogee, it's uh, 58.5 meters. And then this is just, an, uh, this actually, this value is calculated from when I run this profile with the thrust curve and that's incorrect. So we won't look at that because I'm having problems with that right now. But I'll fix that for the future. I had it working and then I changed something I didn't notice and now it's breaking. So that's all right, it happens. Now we could take this data and we could put this mass of a kind of generically sized rocket similar to Compi into into open rocket and see what kind of numbers we get. And we actually, when I did it with the B6-2 engine that I launched last time, I actually, my numbers matched open rocket almost exactly. Cause I mean, at these speeds, 20, 30 meters per second, you're not getting significant amount of drag, especially if the rocket's stable and cutting through, you know, with aerodynamic shape. So, so it's, it's pretty good representation. And what I like about it is I can say what mass my rocket is. Say, I, you know, I build another rocket that's 200 grams. And I look at, you know, I'm going to know how that's going to behave based on different thrust profiles. And I need to get this de shoot deploy time close to 100%. That means they'll be deploying at Apogee and with a safe speed. See here, this is going to deploy on the way down almost out of my 20 per second little metric here so I could just click through all the different shoot or different rocket engines and see I saw a good one that'd be horrible I'd be that'd deploy the shoot you know on the way up still going three or going 30 meters per second you know 100 feet per second that would be dangerous for the shoot I saw one in here yeah look at that so if I use a C11 three engine with the rocket of 200 grams um, just based on this average force calculation 
it should deploy right at apogee, going back to basically zero uh, feet per second in the vertical direction. Um, so I think that would be a good engine to use for a rocket that weighed 200 grams. Right now, there's a lot of other things you'd like to, you should take into account when picking the rocket engine. Uh, but this is just a good, quick way to click through engines and see, hey, if I build, if I just 3D print an entire rocket, totally new design, and I don't know what engine I should use in it. And if it's a super light, small little rocket, I would want to use, looking like the best one I saw here, a C65 would be good. Yeah, I mean, you definitely wouldn't want to go high up here. You're going to have problems. But a C65 would give me a good uh, shoot deploy time. And you could, you know, search for your altitude goal, too. Maybe I want this rocket to go really low. Like, this is only going to go 60 feet in the air. But see, the shoot's not going to deploy until on the way down, going 50 feet per second right before it hits the ground. So that wouldn't be good. But you could get close. See, that one would probably work just fine. Maybe it'd be deploying a little high. But I think it's a, a useful tool, it, at least getting a rough idea of what rocket engine to use, maybe for your first flight, to just try it out, and then from there you can move on. And this program's only going to get better. When I incorporate the thrust curve data, I'm going to get much more accurate numbers here. Um, and then when I incorporate a little bit of drag, not, I don't think I'm going to look at stability so much, mainly just apply some simple drag to get uh, a more realistic number. Uh, more realistic calculations of how the rocket is going to perform with the thrust and with some drag applied. Uh, I don't think I'll worry about shoot. Like the shoot drag as it falls for that timing. It'll mainly just be the, the upward flight and when to deploy the shoot. Alright, well that's what I have so far. So we looked at our data that we were going to get with our 150 gram compi using a C63 engine. Uh, we can look at our data and we can compare that to Open Rocket and we can compare it to what we see in real life and, uh, and see how that works out. I'll show you how I do that next. So, here, this is um, we're going to compare what my program, the information my program puts out compared to what I actually saw with the flight of Compu 1. So, for the first flight of Compu 1, we used the B62 engine. Uh, so, I already explained all this, but following through the calculations, we should see an apogee of 29 meters, so about almost 100 feet. Uh, we should see the, the thrust of about 0.9 seconds of thrust duration. And then we reach that apogee at three seconds into flight. So three seconds into flight, we should see apogee. And then uh, this chute didn't open fully, so we should see about a 5.45 second uh, total flight. Um, and because the chute didn't open, uh, it fell mostly ballistic with you know little drag. Um, it'll be definitely a, sl a slower time due to drag, but not much. Uh, we should see a two-second time delay, so we can do that. So one one method of doing this is I use Reaper. It's a uh, uh, mainly for music, recording music. It's a recording music uh, workspace, but you can use it. I'm familiar with it, so I like to use it for things like this. So I, I bring the video in, and then I watch the video closely, and I. I mark when things happen. So see here, I marked official launch right when the rocket, not at the, as soon as the rocket starts moving, we'll mark launch right there. So we'll go ahead and move that marker. Let's just go ahead and delete that marker. It looks like I was a little bit, a little bit off on that. So we'll just move right to when it launches right there. Insert a marker, call that launch. Now we'll, we'll repeat, that, repeat that process for everything else. So, so you can hear the thrust, you can see the thrust on the audio. So as soon as that thrust cuts out, right, right there. Let's go ahead and insert a marker there for thrust cut out. And then we'll keep going, we can kind of Estimate apogee based on when you see the rock go up and start to come back down. Now that's kind of rough. It's kind of hard to see. There's not much reference points when you're looking at open sky, but it's probably pretty close. To that would be about half a second. And then you'll see when the shoot pops there, and then when it hits the ground, right there. So now we can take these things and see how they compare to our other programs. So we can just go from here launch to thrust cutouts should have been 0.9 seconds according to the data sheet 
and that's happening at only 0.734 seconds, which is much shorter than what we expected. But if you go all the way down to where the thrust tapers off, <coughs> and probably start that when the thrust barely begins, now you're seeing 0 0.82, 0 0.88 seconds. So there's your 0.9 seconds. So obviously they account for that thrust duration to go from the second the thrust is beginning all the way until it tapers off and ends. Not really the points that matter, but the points where it starts to start. Um, let's see what else. We had a total time to apogee being, I think it was three, let's see. So here's 2.15 seconds. I calculated three seconds. So definitely reached apogee sooner. So we probably don't have the height that we expected to get out of this, <coughs> which is fine. Um, let's see. So delay from thrust cutout to when the chute deployed, we're seeing 2.5. Two six, so almost two and a third seconds. So well, about two and a quarter seconds, and we should have seen two seconds. So let's see here. Maybe if we go from when thrust act actually cut out to when the shoot deployed, we see two point two seconds. So still, I'd say about 0 0.2 seconds longer, which is kind of significant when the total flight time is only five or six seconds. Right, a fifth of a second is is a lot, and that shoot deploying 0 0.2 seconds later. Um, didn't help the situation here. Uh, let's see, what other metrics do we have to look at? Um, can't tell altitude from this. We can do some simple, you know, calculation based on time of descent, but this program does that anyways, based on this data. Uh, flight time, total flight time with no shoot. There really wasn't much of a shoot if you look at the data. So let's see total flight time from launch to landing. We get about 4.3 seconds. And this calculated, it should go for 5.46 seconds. So definitely, this rocket did not fly the 29 or 95 feet. Let's go ahead and do that quick calculation on our own. From apogee to landing with little to no drag because the chute didn't really deploy. It's only 2.2 seconds also. So let's go back to Excel and do that math. So to go from 2.2 seconds here to get the, the apogee, we would use this equation here, right here. That equation right there with gra uh, gravity and 2.2 seconds. So let's say equals one half times gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second times 2.2 seconds squared gets us 23.7 meters. So definitely less than what we calculated, which is 77.7 feet. So that's what the, the that's the apogee we actually calculate looking at the video times to see how far it should fall. That's probably way closer to truth than this estimation is. And I'd say that's mostly due to thrust uh, thrust differences between the model of that engine and what actually how that engine performed, but also due to some drag. There's definitely drag. That rocket is short and stubby, so it's it's being slowed down by the air it's cutting through as it flies. Um, so I say it's a combination of, of engine uh, variation and and um, aerodynamics and drag that are resulting in the lower apogee. But it does show that this this quick off the book uh, Excel program does a decent job of estimating what the rocket's going to fly to, and it'll only get better as I incorporate the thrust curve and get some drag in here. It'll it'll bring those numbers down to reality, and then then this program will be just as handy of a reference as Open Rocket for calculating flight performance. Uh, maybe not stability, but that's fine. Maybe we'll get there one day. And that's all I was going to show. So 